Hey, Joe. Dude, how's it going? Yeah, not bad, thank you. How are you? Good, yeah. I, w I was so scrambled, man. For some reason, I thought I had read Wednesday on your message, and no, oh, man, I'm all kinds of confused here. I just have too, too much shit on my plate, and then I was like, so wait a minute, I missed it? I thought I missed it. I'm just totally scrambled, dude. I'm, my apologies. No, but, no, don't worry. Uh, I know I know. Gary pencil, penciled it in for this Friday at 4.30, English time. Yeah, I am, like, out of my mind. I don't know, like, <laughs> somehow I had Wednesday and Friday, like, mixed up in my head. I'm just I'm just doing too much stuff, dude, so sorry. <laughs> no, don't worry about it. Thanks for doing the interview. So I'm glad, uh, you, like, I'm glad you like the review I sent you. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. You know, I have to say, I have to say this. I've never, and actually, no disrespect to you whatsoever, but I've never actually heard of you until you joined White Snake. Yeah, I think there's a lot of people like that overseas because I, a, a lot of my gigs were U.S. based. Night Ranger, for as much as they're known and sold a lot of albums, do a lot of touring in the U.S. and um, and then a little Japan, but very little U.K. or Europe or South America or Australia. Um, so I, TSO, same deal. That's a U.S. thing, and uh, Rock of Ages was uh, basically just a Broadway gig here in town. So I think there was a lot of people in the U.S. And then White Sync was really great for me because I finally got out to see the world a bit. <laughs> yeah, excellent. So we have mutual friends, Joe and um, Chris Caffrey. Yeah, yeah, and my like, um, buddy Russell Allen. Yeah. Do you happen to know Jack Frost? I, I don't know Jack, but I know who he is. Right, okay, so he's another yeah. friend of mine. I thought okay. we'd have been, like, being in sabotage and kind of, like, you kind of being with Trans-Siberian Orchestra, the same sort of crowd. Yeah, I you know, I don't think I've even met him, maybe, uh, you know, in a blur. i got to remember, it's a lot of years. I've been in TSO 10 years now. Wow. But, uh, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, I definitely know who he is, but I don't, I don't think we've even met. Yeah, I've been to New York once, and so that was in 1997. Okay. So I'm to go to Long Island, stay with some friends in a band, and we went to see Overkill in, in Long Island, which was an awesome show. Oh, nice, yeah. Yeah, it was the uh, sure. first time I've been to the States, but I've never been back since, unfortunately. Not yet. <laughs> so I'll say thank you for doing this interview. So I'm going to ask you some warm-up questions first. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, when you first started playing an instrument, was the guitar the first choice for you? Uh, yeah, that's the first one I wanted to do. My parents had me play cello and piano when I was really little. And uh, then the first one I actually expressed an interest in was guitar. Right, okay. So who, who, is anybody in your family musical influence, uh, musical players like cello or anything, or is it just yourself? Uh, my parents are classical musicians. So uh, basically uh, piano and organ and conducting. Right, so you got into that, then you got in straight into Ingvay Malmsteen, I guess. <laughs> ah. No, it didn't really work out that way. I was I, I was into ACDC, Black Sabbath, Ozzy, Iron Maiden, Scorpions, uh, all that stuff. Ingve came along a few years into my playing. I started at 11, and I think uh, I first heard the live Alcatraz album. That's really where Ingve. I mean, I, I, I was included in the Steeler, but uh, I think I heard Ingve when I was 14 or 15, I want to say. So have you always be, been based in New York, then? You're a New, New Yorker? Fulham all the way through like no I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago so I grew up pretty much like a midwestern suburban kid and then uh, a couple years in LA when I went to GIT and uh, worked a year at Cherokee Recording Studios and then back to Chicago and then came out to New York here in top of 2001 and I've been here now for over 20 years which is crazy well one of my favorite bands actually comes from Chicago um, a band called Trouble Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. great. They're, they're yeah. Like doom gods. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, great, great band. So, can you remember the very first guitar you got? What your parents bought you? At first, I had to start on my <laughs> stepmom's acoustic, and I had somebody teaching me out of the Alfred's Method book, and I was kind of bumming out. I was like learning to read the notes on the high E, and I was like, "How do I? How do I be that? How? How do I turn into that guy in ACDC? You know, that's all I wanted to do. So. My friend, thankfully, had an electric guitar, and he said, oh, no, man, go up to this store at the mall and, you know, buy an electric and then take from that teacher there. He'll teach you rock stuff. And so that was uh, an Electra West tone is what I went up and got. And my parents wanted me to prove that I was going to stick to it before they bought me an amp. So I, I was plugging into the home stereo auxiliary input, basically, at first uh, with my Electra West tone and cranking it up. 
funny you should mention that because I used to play guitar for a short time. I'm, I'm a drummer myself, but I did the same thing with you, plugged it into me, into me audio on my hi fi, and it nearly blew the speakers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, do you still have that guitar? Did you manage to keep I, it? I don't. Sadly, way back then, when I wanted my second guitar, we sold that, and that's my. <laughs> That's the one piece I really regret not having in the old collection, you know, is that first guitar. Yeah, a lot of musicians seem to, like, get rid of them and think, damn, I should have kept that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. That's the one where I'd love to say, like, this is what I started on right here. So what, what guitar did you go to after that one, then, when your parents did decide to know that you were very interested in playing guitar properly? So it was a it was a Kramer Beretta. Back then, the, the Floyd Rose thing was all the rage, you know. So uh, I really went from that. Uh, to uh, basically a modified Phil Collin model Jackson. So I started out very much in all like the Floyd Rose guitars, you know. And uh, then a main guitar became uh, for a while a, a Tele, a Strat. Um, there was a lot of experimentation before I ended up landing on a Les Paul and going, well, geez, what took me so long? Right, because they have a distinct sound for like, a real good tone for like metal and rock, don't they? The Les Pauls. Uh, I mean, Les Paul's by easily my favorite sounding guitar. It's not even close. So yeah, I'm amazed it took me so long, and I and I I really very quickly felt right at home with a Les Paul. I was it it was like something that had been meant to be that I just hadn't done. Right then. So uh, which guitarist inspired you growing up? Then which bonds? Which guitarist did you look up to and think I want to sound like this guy? Uh, I mean, definitely Angus made me want to start, and a lot of that was just his vibe, you know, more than his playing. I wasn't smart enough to know he had great pocket in his playing. I was just like, look at that guy, he's awesome. And uh, so that, I, I was very much into, like, bands. I wasn't thinking about being a guitar player in a way, if that makes sense. I mean, I liked this stuff for the songs when I was a kid, so I, I looked at it like what I told you, ACDC, Black Sabbath, Ozzy, Iron Maiden, Scorpions. That's the stuff that I was into really young, and then... I'd say, uh, as I got a little older, got into uh, Dokken, Queensryche, uh, and then also mellower bands like Journey, Foreigner, Boston, uh, prog progressive bands like Rush and Yes, and all the guitar records, you know, the uh, Yngwie, Vi, Satriani, uh, Steve Morse, um, and then classic rock stuff, Pink Floyd, Hendrix, The Doors, um, you know, I like all that stuff too. So there, there was a lot of influences. Right, and was you a big? Was you very much influenced by the shrapnel records artists back in the day, like Racer X and all those sort of bands? Yeah, a bit. I mean, not not so much the Racer X stuff. I I definitely got the McAlpine and the Vinnie Moore records, and then at some point, I kind of just I, I fell away from that stuff a bit. You know, it's kind of like when I got to GIT, I became overload and I started to be more into like the bands like I uh, again. Uh, but definitely, uh, I'd say the, the biggest influences were the ones I named with the guitar records, the uh, Yngwie, uh, Vi, Satriani. And none of, you know, none of these guys were guys where I bought like every record, but I had like, you know, three Yngwie albums that I really wore out and uh, I had the big albums from Vi, you know, I had Passion of Warfare and wore that out and uh, definitely wore out Surfing with the Alien for Satriani and uh, Steve Morse, I loved the Steve Morse band, The Introduction and High Tension Wires. Those were like the two cassettes I owned that I just listened to over and over. Yeah, I used to listen to quite a lot of bands, like I said, on Shrapnel Records, like Racer X, Vicious Rumors, Apocrypha, mm -hmm. Cacophony, all them guitar shredding stuff. I could never really get my head around instrumental albums. After a few few songs, I'd just drift away. You know, yeah. you have a love of them or hate them. <laughs> yeah, I was into them. I, I definitely liked that. Uh, I would say that that fell more in the category of... Uh, the guys I'm talking about, though. But I, I liked it. I, I recorded a lot of that stuff through my time, even at GIT, I had a, I had a four track back then and would record instrumental after instrumental. And it wasn't, it wasn't so much from a standpoint of tons of chops though. I was doing a little bit more like creative stuff with it and trying to be weird and, you know, yeah. pushing the boundaries. Like when you're a kid, you know, it's, uh, that's the fun stuff is just being super creative and weird and like, Hey, wouldn't it be great to do this? And, you know, I, I hadn't really wrapped my head around the fact about like, Oh, no one's going to actually want to listen to that. <laughs> right then, so so what age was you when you started playing guitar? What age did you actually pick up a guitar and start playing it? 11. 11. 
So what was your first band then? How old was you when you got your first band going? Uh, first band was 15. I used to get together and jam with some drummers and stuff, and we had set lists, but my first full band that did a gig was 15. Right, which band was that? Uh, it's called Outcry. Right. Were they a uh, band from Chicago area? Well, yeah. I mean, we had our own we had our own stuff, and we covered a lot of docking and, you know, stuff like that. It was kind of... Uh, we, we weren't ready for prime time, but we thought we were, you know, at the time. Right then, so so what? So um, did you not get a record deal or anything, or did any labels approach you? Oh that? God, no! I think if I played it for you, you'd be hard pressed not to laugh at it. Do you know? I mean, I, I'd be very I, I, mean, I, I was just fifteen, you know. I wasn't really even good, you know. It was just I look back on it and it's like, whew, man! I, I'm surprised nobody pulled me aside and said, mate, you know, you better you best hang it up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, none of your old band members have been in touch with you. Let's make a record, or you made it famous. <laughs> It's all good, man. You know, it's uh, I've had an interesting journey to get where I got. So, but I, I was not ready at a young age. No, right then. So, what was your actual pro- first professional band then that you joined or played with? Uh, uh, well, I, I supplemented my income with te- teaching and then supplemented it with gigs all the way until I was thirty. So I teach seventy students a week. And then I would gig, and I, you know, I don't know that any of those were like full time jobs, you know. Uh, that it basically was like stuff I'd gig on the weekend. I had my own bands in the Chicago area, and then started to play with some other people's bands, and uh, and all that stuff just kind of built up. And then I ended up getting this uh, theater gig called Love Janice. It was a show about Janice Joplin, and that's why I came to New York to do that. And that was eight shows a week so that's the first time I just became like a full-time performer was really all the way at 30 years of age uh and then from there it's just been a you know even stranger journey if I tell you all the stuff I've been through since then you'd go well geez man you know yeah and when he said about Rock of Ages because I was interviewing a band from Germany last year that I'm friends with Vanden Plass Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah you probably know that they do a lot of theatre work in Germany it's like Jesus Christ mm-hmm. Superstar and what other the theatres they do they spend a lot of time in the in theatres than they do playing gigs because that's where they earn the money uh yeah man i mean that that was my my first break and i at that stage of the game you know that the the, uh, the 90s had gone full swing and like taking all the you know play with chops out of the equation and everything so I was just I just did everything that came across my radar for many many years in terms of being able to gig and make money and uh, and I had the teaching thing thank God to save my ass the entire time you know how did and, you get into uh, that Joe how did you get into the teaching what what how did you how did you approach to to say hey I'm good enough to teach. Uh, I mean, I started doing that instinctually, I think, even with a couple beginners when I was only about 14, 15. I'd only been playing a few years, and I had students ready that I would teach them some stuff and get them going. And I found it was better than working at the local gas station or whatever, you know. So I, it was always a good way to make some money, and it was secure, you know. Like, I, I could get out of guitar school and go, all right, you know, I can, like I said, there was no shortage of it, man. Everybody wanted to play guitar back then, so yeah. teaching 70 students a week, and then, gosh, you know, no no problem if I get a gig. I'm my own boss. I can cancel those lessons and say, can't make it this week. So it, it was fun. Brilliant, because only in 2018 you joined Night Range. Obviously, Brad Gillis, he must have been the guitar teacher before. Was he in the same sort of line as, as you was, like guitar teaching before Night Ranger? Uh, oh, I don't know what, what Brad did. I mean, I, I know he had the Aussie gig, of course, replacing uh, yeah. Randy, you know, but um, in terms of the way he made his living, I think he was really young when all that stuff broke for him, man. You know, I think he had the Alameda All-Stars before um, before he got the Aussie break and then Night Ranger took off straight from there. So. You know, Brad's one of those guys that sold millions of albums very early on. So uh, he didn't have, he didn't have a lot of the same <laughs> right. so was, that I had. <laughs> so, so was Night Ranger your very fir- your very first professional band you joined then? Um, well, in terms of like where I was only making my living from them, I, I you know I don't know what that necessarily means because I went from playing with Love Love Janice, which was a theater gig, into gigging with the Turtles, and I was playing, I subbed on guitar, and then they hired me on bass, so the Turtles is, you know, the song Happy Together, 
And then uh, I also played a bit with Big Brother and the Holding Company because that that music director, the guitar player, was the music director for Love Janice. So I was kind of in the oldie scene, you know, the Turtles and Big Brother and the Holding Company. And I had played with Jim Peterick uh, doing sessions at his place and his world stage band. And that's really what led to Night Ranger because Kelly Kagi was one of the guest artists every year on that. I'd see him once a year. And he mentioned that, you know, Night Ranger might need somebody. And I, I ended up getting an audition, which was a gig, and, and got the gig. But I was also playing with uh, Scrap Metal, which was the Nelsons and Kelly and Mark Slaughter and doing some gigs. So, I mean, I had things that were like, see, you know, some named people prior to Night Ranger. Uh, but it wasn't necessarily a full-time scenario. And I don't really know that Night Ranger was either, because pretty much soon after I had Night Ranger, I got Rock of Ages. And and out of that so uh, you know it's it's kind of a hard thing to say like you know what what you mean by professional band and yeah. all those are all those are pro acts it just did different levels you know yeah so how many albums did you actually record with night ranger then how many albums did you do uh two studio and one live which was an acoustic record the live one right okay what well, the two albums you, you played on studio album, uh, which, which one's your favorite and why do you have a favorite uh, I, I'd probably say somewhere in California just because I was new in the band and it was just a lot of fun to be making my first record with those guys and um, on the support of that record we had a big tour with Foreigner and Journey and uh, that was great fun. We did actually get through Europe on that and get out and, and see the world a bit. So um, yeah, it was great. Good times. Brilliant then. So moving on to so Whitesnake, how did you find out that um, Dave was looking for a, a new guitarist? So who told you about him? How did, how did you guys hook up? <clears throat> um, I basically just saw like everybody else. I mean, I saw online, but oddly enough, I been t I texted Doug the night before all that news kind of came out and was texting with him because we've we've been you know buddies for a while and mainly over our kids, you know, talking about being dads. And so uh, anyway, I ended up uh, sort of finding my way to get an audition. Really, Phil Carson, Foreigner's manager, helped me out because I had filled in for Mick Jones in 2011 on very short notice when he was sick and so um, he, he basically twisted David's arm and got me an audition and um, things went really well and got off of the gig and and uh, here I am now gosh this is already like six seven years later wow Crazy. <laughs> so when you said you got the audition was it was it you in the in the studio with David watching you playing or <clears> did, <throat> how did it work that yeah I flew out there and I mean first we talked yeah, that's always the main thing just see if you get along and click and um so that that went really well. I felt like we did get along really well and still do. And, and then uh, he put up some of the stuff for the Purple Album. He put up Lady Double Dealer, and he had me uh, like improvise a solo over in the middle break. And, and they, they dug what I did. It was David and Reb, basically. And uh, they, they liked what I did in that. And then uh, I ended up laying down a harmony solo, too, the harmony solo that's on there right after my solo. Now, that actually, I believe, is what's on the record, what I played in that audition. Um, so anyway, kind of a neat story. And then we went upstairs, we ate dinner, and then we sang a little bit. And uh, and that was that, man. All right, excellent. So are you still with Whitesnake now, then? Are you still... Yeah. 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 So what's happening to you in the works of doing a new album after you promoted your solo album? You were talking about making a new album together. I mean, that's all up to David. David's been promoting the Red, White, and Blues uh, compilation trilogy over the last year or so. And, uh, you know, we'll, we'll see what his next uh, plans are very soon, I'm sure. So what did you think about doing the Purple Album, that being your debut? How how did you feel about doing that as a debut with White Snake? Uh, I mean, I, I liked it. I thought that was a great way to join the band, you know. It was like uh, they were already working on it, so it wasn't like I came up with the concept or anything like that. It was it was what the band was doing, and so I thought, yeah, it so sounds like great fun opportunity to come in and play on some proven songs, have an album come out right away, tour on it. Um, so, yeah, I, great time. I mean, I look back on it very fondly. So how does your guitar, your guitar tone sound differ from Doug Aldrich or John Sykes on the Flesh and Blood album? How, do you, how does your sound differ, for those that don't know? Uh, oh, man, I don't know. You know, I don't really want to compare and contrast. It's just kind of, you know, you, you just fire it up, man. You know, I used a, a modded JCM 800 that um, it's actually one of Slash's heads that uh, his tech hooked me up with for the session. And um, so, yeah, there you go. Brilliant. So when you look back at the old White Snake albums, do you have a favorite White Snake album, and why? Which one's your favorite? Uh, I mean, 
I guess, you know, I love everything. I love the entire catalog, but I, I got to probably go with the 87 record just because that's the one that I, I listened to really a lot when I was a kid. And so there's like, there's a special level there for me of, uh, uh, I guess, interest in it, you know? That's when you should say that because it's my favorite album. I think it's just the the guitar screeching of John Sykes just screaming all the way through the album was just amazing. Yeah, it's just a cool. It's a it's a cool combination of the the blues rock thing with the um, you know with the pop. Right. I'd say you know with the commercial right. It's they 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 found a really nice balance on that record of those two sounds. Absolutely. So after that, you did a little, you did some touring with Cher. I mean, that must have been awesome for you been with up with Cher for a, a while yeah yeah that was something where I was going in to like fill in for you know a couple gigs like a sh couple shows and it ended up turning into a few years so that was a <laughs> surprise um, so yeah great opportunity to, to work with a, a legendary performer and, and a lot of those shows were really big man when she took it on the road I mean we were playing uh, in Sweden I think it was 20 24 25,000 people with a single show so um, you know it was great yeah, after that you did some like solo albums. Are these all instrumental albums? The Und Undefined, The Moon Is Falling, thir 13 Acoustic Songs, are they all instrumental albums? Those are instrumental albums. Uh, two, 2000, 2003, and 2006, yeah. I believe. Or maybe 2001 for Undefined, where I actually got it out. It right, was, so, so what musicians yeah. played on them then with you? What drummers and bass players did you <clears throat> That's uh, Virgil Donati on drums on the, the first two, and Rick Fiorabracci on bass. A uh, couple, you know, insane world-class dudes. And then uh, the 13 acoustic songs was a combination of percussionists and uh, Tim Tim Lefebvre on bass, who's gone on to have uh, quite a career as well. So, um, uh, yeah, some, some great musicians. Yeah, because you say when you met Jim Virgil, he, he played drums with Ring of Fire, Matt Bowles, his other band. Yeah, Virgil <clears throat> was somebody that I connected with through my old teacher, TJ Helmrich, and, uh, who became my friend over the years, and uh, TJ was working with him. Him and Brett Garson were working with that, both those guys as a rhythm section. I filled in for Brett at Soundcheck, basically, on a gig of theirs. I played Brett's parts, and those guys were like, hey, you sound great, man, if you ever have anything you want me to want us to record on and so I thought shit I better do an album with these guys man you know so I just took whatever I had going on at the time which was a combination of uh, some of the stuff I was playing with an acid jazz band at the time I mean it was like you know so it's kind of funky and, uh, and a couple of little rock things I had in my back pocket instrumentals and um, just gave it to them and said shoot let's just make an album man it's gonna be great oh, yes. and uh, that was, it was very exciting to work with them Virgil's just a, he's just unreal phenomenal what about the bass player you mentioned? I've never heard what band was he with. Uh, Rick was mainly known for uh, playing with Frank Abali and Andy Summers and also with Yanni. He's the guy on that Live at the Acropolis. A lot of people know his bass solo on there because it's sort of like, holy crap, look at this bass player, you know? Um, so if anybody goes and watches that concert, they can see Rick tearing so, it up. So the next question I'm going to ask you about your, your, the 13 Project. Is that a project or is that a band? So it's, it's a project because I, I write everything. Uh, the musicians basically, you know, wouldn't, wouldn't be fair to them if I said this is a band. And it doesn't sound like a solo album, right? Because yeah. I'm not singing on it. I'm not, it's not instrumental. So for me, I, I thought, look, I got to give this a project name, something with my name and something attached. So it's like separates it from my solo album, but people know it's my baby. So, um, you know, I mean, I'm writing the lyrics and the vocal melodies and everything on it. So it definitely is my thing, but I wanted something that sounded like a band. Right. And so the first album that you did was Dying to Live. I mean, with Russell, how do you hook up with Russell? Because I'm, I'm friends with Symphony X. Russell joined TSO right at the time I was looking for a singer for it, man. I had Tony Franklin and Vinnie Apice in the fold, and I thought, man, I need somebody I can sing Dio, but I'd love to find somebody that can sing, you know, like Forner and Paul Rogers and... You know, Russ can do all that, so it was amazing. Right, then, did you ever think of considering Jan Lande when you just mentioned all those? <clears throat> those... Uh, I, I, I don't really know Jorn at all. I, it just has so happened that Russell joined TSO. I, the, what I've heard of Jorn, I, I think he's amazing, but um, we, we don't know each other at all. No, no, because like I said, on the rest of the album, you've got, like, Jeff Scott Soto on the album, Vinnie Apice. I, I actually drum tech for Vinnie Apice in, in, in my home city three years ago. Oh, okay, right we, on. We, we, had a, we, yeah. had a festi we had a festival over here called Hair Metal Heaven. I don't, mm -hmm. know, if you, I don't know if you knew about that festival, Hair Metal I Heaven. 
I don't believe so. No, it was 26 bands in three days. Okay. I did 26 drummers on my own in three days with two drum kits. Wow. <laughs> we had TNT, we had Treat, we had Loudness, we had Eclipse, Leather Wolf, and then Vinnie came on stage with George Lynch, uh, Sebastian Bach, um, the guitarist who was with, with uh, Vinnie Vince, um, Vince Neil and Brett Woods on guitar and like Vinny was so cool to work with really nice guy yeah yeah he's he's great man uh, you know we, we've kind of become quite a bit we didn't really know each other going into this man I knew Tony and Tony said hey how about Vinny and I thought hey that's perfect for this because I want something that takes me back to my roots that made me want to start and the Dio stuff was a big part of that, man. I mean, listening to uh, Dio and Black Sabbath with Vinny as a kid, you know, it's a whole lot of my my upbringing. So, uh, yeah, great to and it's great to get to know him or the the process there. I'd like I definitely I'd like to work with him again. It was a really like I say, it was a really easy going guy, and he thanked me and he asked me to put the drum kit behind the back land the night before he played. So I hid his drum kit for him and told everybody else there was no more drum kits. Yeah. <laughs> so he's like shook my hand and said, "Oh, it's amazing that you've done that for me." He was like really pleased and that. So, like I say, you got Tony Franklin on bass. I noticed on the on the album that he's he's busy, he has a distinct bass sound, especially when he did the Blue Murder. A lot of bass sliding, but you don't actually hear that on your albums, do you? Um, yeah, probably more or less just the way it's mixed. I mean, it's a pretty it's a dense. These are both dense albums, you know. But there's a lot going on with keyboards and a lot of guitar tracks, and um, so. You know, it's it's not exactly like one guitar track panned off to one side and Tony panned to the other. So, uh, but you know, it's in there. Yeah. What about Jeff Scott Soto? How did you hook up with Jeff? Uh, Jeff and I we met back when I was playing with Scrap Metal at Melodic Rock Fest back before I played in Night Ranger, and uh, so we've known each other for a while. We got really tight during TSO rehearsals, you know, because um, I see him in there. We'd hang out for a couple weeks. He asked me to co-write with him back when he um i guess it was in 2011 for his album uh, damage control so i wrote a couple songs that uh on that with him and we've we've been good friends ever since i mean we're, we're very tight he's one of the best guys in the music business man i just love jeff yeah because he did the backing vocals with tsl don't say just with the th three four of the singers did what the backing vocals mm -hmm. if i believe so so when yeah. you when you look at your first album that you did, your uh, Dying to Live, which which, fa which songs are your favourite from the first album that you did with those guys? Do you have any favourite uh, songs? Uh, it's really hard to to pick your favourites on those. I mean, I, I like it all. I think that uh, all the songs were strong. The only difference was I think this time around with Running Games was just like um, <clears throat> focusing the 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 style a bit more. You know, there was a lot of diversity on Dying to Live. All the way from the heaviness to say goodbye to the sun to like you know the kind of almost like alternativeness of what we believe you know kind of an alternative ballad so it was there was a lot of different sounds on that record and but the center of it was that melodic hard rock that i called dio-ish at its heaviest and foreigner-ish at its lightest and so that's what i tried to focus on for running games right then so now you produced the album yourself the new album didn't you yeah yeah how long did it take to you for you to record this album with it being locked down, was it was it an easy process? How uh, it was about halfway done when all this COVID stuff kind of kicked in, and everybody's schedules had been so busy, it had almost been on the back burner to a degree, you know. And and uh, it was nice actually. It was one of the silver linings. Was it this shit freed up everybody's schedules so I could get it done? Right then. So, is, so do you have any favorite songs at all? Which albums did you enjoy playing, recording? Which ones, like you thought, wow, this is the this is the song, you know? Um, I mean, you know, same deal there. I definitely feel good about all the songs on the album. I'd like to think it's all killer, no filler. So if people pick it up, I think they'll be pleased all the way from the opening to the closing. So how do you see this album as a progression from the first album that you did? Yeah, like I said, same same idea, but just focused, more focused this time. Yeah, I think you can I think you can tell when I reviewed the album, I could hear the difference. He's like, yeah, it's tighter unit. You guys are like, you know what you're doing. You're more comfortable around each other now you've done one album together. Yeah, I think everybody liked the first one, which is great, because everybody came back to do the second one. So that 
that means they must have liked it enough to to want to come back. So that it was nice to have the same lineup and have some consistency there and continuity under the the, the project name, so people know what to count on and they understand what the sound is of it. So yeah, it it was nice to to hone that a bit and. Uh, Hopefully, looking forward to another one yet in the future here. So, how long did it take to record this album? Um, you know, it's a hard one to answer because I I laid down guitar tracks, uh, rough guitar tracks that went to Vinny and Tony, and I don't even remember when exactly that was. Um, but I would say it was more about people's schedules, though, than the actual time of spent like laboring on it. There was a lot of stuff. I mean, uh, along the way, Russell got hurt in TSO rehearsals. I mean, he had a serious fall and broke ribs and was knocked unconscious. I mean, it was an event. So um, there was stuff like that that set us back. But I I would rather wait and do a great album with Russell than, you know, just try and rush something out there. So it's weird uh, that, you've, that you've got Russell on vocals because I, I remember reviewing one of his, his solo albums he did, that Atomic Soul, is it? Atomic Soul album that he uh, released. Oh, that, okay. That was kind of same sort of style as what you're doing, kind of kind of bit of Badlands sort of influence in there and stuff. Mm-hmm. That was a good album, man. I don't know if you never heard it or not. Did you actually hear it? I haven't. No. Oh, you need to get Russell to play with. So, 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 I mean, with lockdown, was it does, was it difficult for you to actually do this album? How, how did it affect you all with lockdown, like everybody else? No, I, I, quite the opposite. I think it freed everybody up, which was nice. I mean, we were about halfway done, so I think the fact that this stuff kicked in really helped us to get it done. Right then. So the album cover, who did the artwork for this album? And was, and was that your first choice of the artwork? Uh, that's a, a UK girl, uh, Christine Robinson. I've seen, uh, we've been friends on social media, and I've seen some of her work, and I thought, you know, that, that looks great. And uh, so when it came time this time around, I, I hit her up, and, and she said, pretty much first idea, you know. Uh, was what we're looking at. I mean, I think we tweaked it a bit, but she she came up with a great idea out of the gate. Right then, so Running Games, why did you decide to call the album Running Games? Um, I mean, I think the songs are all sort of tied together by being about, uh, you know, escape and uh, maybe my attachment disorder of sorts, you know, so um, it just kind of, you know, a lot of time writing on the road, too. I think if I walked you through where I wrote every song, you'd be like, geez, it's, a, it's like a geography lesson. So <laughs> a, lot of, a lot of touring during that time. I think to, 2019, I was on the road 285 days out of the year. And so a lot of this stuff was, was not only written on the road, but even recorded on the road. Wow, then. So 13, what, did, what made you want to call it Joe's? 13 what was the reason to call it 13 why that number uh, just a lucky number and i think if you're going to have my name attached to it you need something short right because any my, my name's already like about 300 letters so i think anything more than that people wouldn't be able to even read it so, so how many videos have you, have you are you going to record for this album how many songs are you looking at recording as promo songs um, well, we did uh, an animated video for Finish Line, and I think that's it. Then you get the, the uh, other singles were Hard to Say Goodbye and How Do You, which were audio releases. So, uh, But yeah, that's basically the animated video for Finish Line. Right, so because this album's been, like you said, you, this album's been in the ideas of being around for like a year or so, a year and a half. Do you have any new songs for the next album? I guess you have new ideas already wrote for the next one. Mm-hmm. No, I mean, the, the, pretty much on the heels of this, I had to get uh, riff ideas into Michael Sweet for uh, our project with Nathan James. That's going to be coming out, I believe, later this year. And then from there, um, I've been kind of co-writing with my buddy Jim Peterick, who we mentioned I mentioned earlier, has given me my start with Night Ranger, basically. Um, uh, he's producing an album, and so we've been co-writing a bit. And and uh, got a quarantine jam or two I'm working on right now, and so there, there's just always something going on, man. I'm uh, teaching, doing cameos, uh, doing lots of sessions where I play on people's stuff, and um, so always busy, mate. That's great. There, yeah, so a lot of people will probably be asking you, is this project? Are you going to be touring when lockdown eases? Do you think you'll ever get the chance to tour with this lineup? We did one show in support of Dying to Live on the Monsters of Rock cruise, and I'd, lo- I'd love to make it happen again. Let's just get the world open, and I'll take it from there. Brilliant. And so, I mean, looking like the TSL stuff, you know, the trans librarian I mean, how do you see that? What, what's your opinion on that, that, that thing? Because they're huge in America, aren't they? They're really, really, really popular. Yeah. Yeah, it's a massive production, man. It's really my annual tradition, um, and it's just uh, it's a great group of people in the band. There's a lot of talent involved there, 
So being able to hang with everybody uh, is, is a huge part of the, the fun and playing on that massive stage with amazing production. And they have a very dedicated fan base where everybody's very interested in everything you're doing and they become our friends. And so it's a, it's a really cool it's a really cool gig to have. It's, it's very much a Christmas sort of band, isn't it, really? I mean, in the States, it's basically the the uh, winter tour every year, you know, which, yeah. um, you know, I, I think obviously there's been some other stuff around that, but um, in general, that's what, that's the bread and butter. You know, I look, I look I've seen some videos on live and I've got a few, couple of your albums and I think, wow, what, Sabotage as big as this? <laughs> Consider, yeah. Considering it's half a Sabotage members anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, I, I think that, that that depends where you are in the world, right? I think overseas, sabotage is certainly uh, bigger than TSO, I would say, right? But yeah, I, vice versa here for sure. So, what what plans have you got for the rest of this week? Then, are you just gonna do more interviews? Or are you just gonna relax and chill out? Oh no, no, I'm I'm never chilling out, man. I'm always busy. Like I said, I'm teaching thirty students a week right now on Skype, cameos, quarantine jams. Uh, sessions for people playing on stuff, co-writing with people. Uh, it never ends, dude. You know, it's a, the the touring thing. I miss it right now a lot, but at the end of the day, there's music is about more than just getting out and playing gigs. You know, you got to be able to be dedicated and keep moving forward. Yeah. So, um, what how's the how's the things with Frontier Records? Is are you going to re renew a contract with them after this album? Are you going to think of doing a, a renewal thing with them? Yeah, we got another one coming, so I'm, I'm psyched to do another one, and um, hopefully it won't take us as long as time. Uh... <laughs> Brilliant. All right then, Jarts, thank you for doing this interview. Do you have anything to, to say to the people that will be reading this? Uh, you know, thank you so much for any of the support, streaming a song, buying a, a track, buying an album, coming to a concert, whatever, you're helping me live my dream, so thank you. Uh, brilliant. If you, say, if you see Russell and uh, Vinny, just tell me said hello, please. Much appreciate that. I will, you bet, buddy. Cheers, then, buddy. Thank you. You'll be safe, and I'll speak to you soon. Cheers, Joe.